Hey, everybody. It's uh, really great to be here. Um, never been to Charlottesville before, but it's a really beautiful place. And um, I'm really honored that uh, David and the rest of the team here has had me uh, come tell my story and uh, talk about some of the mistakes that I made. Uh, I thought for my talk today, I would focus on a few things I might have done differently, uh, specifically with my last startup, which is called Gadget or GDGT. Uh, but also to talk about my story, um, and the beginning starts with a site called Gizmodo. Uh, I was actually a technology journalist uh, in the late 90s. I worked uh, as an editor at a magazine called Red Herring, which was a business of technology publication based in San Francisco. And what we did was we covered all the crazy stuff that was going on in the first dot-com wave. I think probably a lot of people uh, not old enough to remember uh, that, but it was the uh, original dot-com boom, lots of companies going public, making billions of dollars, and then going out of business. And Red Herring, uh, the publication that was covering all that, managed to follow the same pattern, uh, grew really quickly, it was the fastest growing magazine in America in the year 2000, and then a year later uh, was basically out of business. I got laid off, lost my job, uh, and was not sure what to do with myself. I was based in San Francisco at the time, decided to move to New York, and if, uh, if I was going to be a broke technology writer, I may as well be that in New York rather than San Francisco, where there was not much going on at that time. I uh, had a friend named Nick Denton, and Nick and I were both uh, ran personal blogs, and we're really interested in blogging, uh, but we're curious whether it could be something that could be transformed from more of a personal diary format to something that you could do maybe professionally and focus on a specific topic and look at how the democratization of publishing, which is enabled by blogging, could let you create a new kind of niche-focused website or publication. And so Gizmodo was what came out of that. I started this in the summer of 2002. It was just me posting uh, about a half dozen to a dozen blog posts a day. This is actually the earliest screenshot I could find of it. Uh, I wish I had taken one from the launch, but I, I didn't really think anybody would care about it, you know, 13 years later. And so uh, it was just very simple. You know, we actually couldn't do very large images at the time because so many people were still on dial-up that if you did really large photos, people would complain about you were clogging, uh, clogging their modem. So uh, this is something I started. Uh, it was a, a, a just a gadget blog, um, and at the time, that was a very novel thing. No one had uh, done a site that was really just about gadgets like this before. So Nick and I had a difference of opinion over the scope or vision of what could be done with something like this. Uh, his idea was for... Uh, blogs to be something that people did kind of part-time, and um, my hope was that I could do this full-time, uh, bring on a staff, and really um, try to make it into a bigger thing that could take on the tech uh, publication giants of the time, which were uh, Wired and CNET. And so I left to start a new site called Engadget, uh, which I did as part of Weblogs Inc. Uh, it was a larger uh, blog network. We um, and Gadget was the flagship site, but there were actually um, lots of other sites. You can see sort of this blog roll uh, on the right-hand side here, which lists um, all the other blogs that were in the Weblogs Inc. network. And so the idea of Weblogs Inc. was let's create lots and lots of blogs on focused niche topics and try to cover them very comprehensively. And with Engadget, for example, I was able to add on a few other people and start to uh, blog nonstop. Um, I wrote uh, sometimes as many as 30 to 35 blog posts a day myself. Uh, in the first 15 months of Engadget, I wrote 5,000 blog posts. I uh, worked about 100 hours a week. Uh, but it paid off because uh, we were acquired by AOL uh, about 18 months after we launched. Started another site around that same time called Joystick, a video game site. Uh, it was actually just shut down by AOL a few months ago, unfortunately. But uh, we took that same model of Engadget and applied it to video games. So uh, after I'd worked at AOL for a, a few years, um, after the acquisition, I started a music site called Record Label. And the idea behind Record Label was take those same principles of the democratization of publishing and being able to go very focused and niche to create a free music site where we'd work with artists and labels to give away their music, completely legal, completely licensed, and uh, see if we could build sort of a viable uh, alternative to the music industry there. Uh, this completely failed, uh, which I think tells you a lot about the challenges of building a music uh, business these days. But I uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Got to work with thousands of really amazing artists. Um, you know, never got to actually meet Kanye West, but we did get to work with him and his label uh, and a bunch of other uh, great people. 
but I actually left AOL to start a new uh, business called Gadget, or GDGT. And what I wanted to do with Gadget was something a little different than blogging. With blogging, I created this hyper fast paced stream of information and data and, and uh, constantly talking about all the new products and the rumors and the speculation and posting product reviews and things like that and found that it was a great site for people that were very passionate about technology and that's really what Engadget's core audience was. I mean it grew to be pretty substantial in size but that core audience of, of technology enthusiasts, of gadget enthusiasts were, were what uh, Engadget aimed at. But if you were someone that was just trying to figure out what to buy, it wasn't necessarily the, the, the best uh, place to go and actually get buying advice about a new product. And so what uh, my co-founder Ryan Block and I, and he was uh, editor-in-chief of Engadget after I stepped down from that role, decided let's try to create a site that really improves and enhances the product buying experience for consumer electronics. And so we came up with Gadget. And so we did a bunch of things with Gadget. Uh, we aggregated product review data from across the web, a little bit like Rotten Tomatoes uh, does for movies or Metacritic does for video games, and put it all together to make it really easy for people to figure out what are the highest ranked products. Uh, and then we created these landing pages or page, uh, for specific products, which would let you see uh, very quickly uh, whether it was worth buying or not, let you track price history, let you uh, get alerts if the price drops and stuff like that. And, and we built this structured database of about 35,000 different consumer electronics products, which we then used to build and surface a variety of things on the website. And so uh, we built this consumer-facing product, and we realized, well, we've gotten to a point where we have so much data now that maybe we could do something else with it. And so we actually started to license that data out to publishers and to other companies via the form of an API. And so one instance that that took was we uh, basically created this embeddable JavaScript module which allowed a publisher to uh, insert our product data into their blog post or their article post. So a publisher could say if they wrote about you know, this product, like the EPAD Transformer Prime TF201, they could actually embed uh, product data, information, and pricing data around it and actually get an a affiliate a fee if someone bought the product through this. So um, we actually were powering at the time of acquisition uh, about 100 million uh, pages a month featured our data via our API. We were acquired by AOL uh, in about two years ago, uh, so came back home uh, full circle. After I came back to AOL, I uh, spent the first six months or so integrating Gadget with Engadget and uh, had a big plan to build an entirely new uh, content management system or publishing platform for AOL using uh, what we had built at Gadget. Got about three months into that project and got killed, uh, which is pretty frustrating. And so where I landed uh, at AOL but six months ago is running a new group called Alpha. And what Alpha is trying to do is to build experimental new products for AOL, taking a lot of the principles that I'd learned doing for startups and trying to uh, roll out quickly new, very lean, simple products to test the hypothesis or idea around that product, get it into market, see if people like it, see if we can learn something from it, and if, there's, if it has potential to keep iterating, working on it, and if it doesn't, to kill it. So we've been around six months, we've launched two products so far, one that just uh, got a uh, 2.0 release earlier this week, uh, and then the other which we're going to kill. So we uh, have learned a lot in that process. It's the, sort of the most startup-like environment that you can have, I think, at a big company, uh, but there are still those challenges. So <laughs> uh, to talk about uh, a lot of the things that I learned specifically from doing Gadget, I wanted to talk about how uh, you often see two different ways that people talk about success and failure at startups. One is the post-mortem, the company failed, and you see the founder writes a post, here's all the things we screwed up. And uh, you know, you, they say you learn a lot from failure, and that's true. Uh, then you see a lot of these, um, there's another example, a lot of these, uh, you know, here's why these guys succeeded. And you talk about all the things they did that succeeded. What I wanted to do, uh, and I wrote a blog post about this after Gadget was acquired, is talk about the things that I wish I had done differently even though things did work out and that you can, even from success, you can still learn some lessons and think about the, uh, the things that, uh, you know, the, the bumps you had along the way that uh, you could have avoided if you had had sort of, you know, the, high, you know, the wisdom at the time. So uh, I have five lessons, I have about five minutes left, so I'll try to do one per minute. Uh, so one of them is be less secretive. 
one of the things that we did uh, when we were launching Gadget is we were obsessed with nobody knowing what we were doing. We were in stealth mode, which sounds really cool, right? And, um, you know, when people ask you what you're doing, you say, I can't tell you I'm in stealth mode. And then, uh, uh, which sounds totally badass. But uh, what happened was we weren't, uh, didn't really have the opportunity to get feedback on our idea early on. Um, it would have been really helpful for us as we were building the product and testing um, uh, what we were doing to actually have just regular people that knew about it and could tell us what they thought. And we deprived ourselves of that opportunity. And it's one of the things I really regret. We wanted to surprise everybody on day one with what we were doing. And the end result is it doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, sorry, I went backwards. Um, so uh, that leads into no big launches. So we, again, we were obsessed with having a really big launch, making a big splash on launch day. We had the New York Times had an exclusive story on our launch, which was great, except that it drove a ton of traffic to the site, which then crashed the site. And uh, <laughs> um, you know, we thought that we were ready for a million people on day one, but we weren't. Uh, but also it meant that we had so much focus on what we were doing right away that we actually didn't have a chance to, again, to test our idea, see what people liked and didn't like, and then fix those mistakes. Obscurity is your friend when you're starting out because it lets you make those mistakes without too much of the spotlight being shown on you. And sometimes when you have a ton of attention on you, you become really afraid of making mistakes, and then you actually aren't able to do the things that will end up leading to a better product down the line. So another one, be less agreeable. Now, this is the one that only really applies if you have another co-founder. And so my co-founder, Ryan Block, and I, we'd worked together for a really long time. We knew how to work really well with each other. And that sounds like a great thing, right? Except the problem is, when we disagreed on something, we actually figured out how to compromise. And that sounds, uh, also sounds great, except what ends up happening is that we were meeting in the middle. So one of us would have a vision for the product, the other would have a vision for the product, and we ended up compromising and doing something that was in the middle that ended up being very mushy and very mediocre. Instead, one person's vision should have won out and we would have had a stronger product down the line, even if one of us would have been unhappy. And in fact, when we started to, uh, as the company grew and we started to subdivide responsibilities and give one person more authority in this area and one person, the other person more authority in this area, that's actually when the company started to grow and the product started to improve because we stopped having to compromise on everything and we actually were able to have one really more focused vision winning out for what we were doing. Second is design matters. I think this is actually especially true in the world of mobile, but what we found is that design of the product uh, design of technology products is incredibly important. You have to really be able to have empathy and understanding of your user and what they're doing and what they need and what, how they're going to use the product. But you also have to create something that's very beautiful and very easy to use. And I think there's a lot of challenges there. We talk about how simple is hard. Uh, but one of the mistakes that we made very early on is that we outsourced design. We hired a shop to do our design. And it was only after we brought the design in-house and actually hired uh, a design and UX team to come, in, uh, come and work for us full time, that we were able to do the things with the product and make the improvements that really started to connect with users. So the last one is don't have to be perfect. And um, this is another mistake that we were guilty of, is that we became obsessed uh, early on with the product being so great that no, we thought we, we didn't want anyone to ever have any complaints about it. We wanted it to be something that we would have no regrets on putting out there. And it meant that we worked way too long on way too many things. It took us too long to get new versions of the site out. And we would have been much better off having put things out there, even if they weren't perfect, but to at least to understand and get feedback from people as to what we could improve and then doing another version rather than working for a year or 15 months on something in secret, then putting it out there, discovering that there was some problem with it or something that what people wouldn't be receptive to, and then having to go back and spend another you know, several months working on it. And so I think letting go of that need to be perfect was really hard for me, uh, someone who uh, you know, felt like uh, I didn't want to have things that weren't amazing out there with my name attached to them. But I've learned that over the years that people are very forgiving uh, as long as you're honest with you're, you know, as long as, you, as long as you're honest with them about what you're doing and also that they know that you've put a good effort into it. And so 
I now try to contextualize everything I do um, with alpha as these are experiments. These are beta products. These are things which we're putting out there as tests or, uh, of a hypothesis or tests of whether this can find product market fit. And uh, the expectations uh, you know, sort of become, uh, uh, you, you're able to manage expectations around the product. And you also say, we're looking for users to give us feedback and to tell us what they like and what they don't like. So thank you. I'm just out of time, so I just got under, under the wire. And if anybody wants to reach me, this is how you can get to me. Thank you.